Welcome to Jim Cannell on Today. This is Bible teaching for the 21st century. I'm really pleased that I can bring Rod Hembry your way again today, as I did last program. Uh, Bible Discovery Television and WOW, Working for Office and Widows and JCT, are partnering in a marvelous missions effort in Chennai, India. We'll be partnering in Africa as well, but this is the step number one in our commitment to overseas missions. And we're going to feature an interview I did with a couple of our champions there in Chennai. And then Rod and I will be having a good talk before the Bible study segment. As I said off the top, Rod Hembry is with me. He is the president and the chief host of uh, Bible Discovery. Uh, I know you love it. And we're talking India. But first of all, take a look at this. I'm sitting with the pastors of Calvary Community Ministries in Chennai, India. Chennai is a long way from North America. For many people, India is a very mysterious country but it's a beautiful country with very fine people, one of the largest populations in the world. And right here in the heart of Chennai, we've got Pastor Vincent and Pastor Prem Samuel, father and son, who are pastoring a church that you, Vincent, established almost 40 years ago. Yes. In your orphan care, Vincent, you're working in what you tell me is the largest slum in Southeast Asia. Have I got that correct? Yes. When I heard about that, I was totally shocked. I didn't realize the largest slum in Southeast Asia. Why is it the largest slum in Southeast Asia? Why does Chennai have this huge slum? Well, these people were sleeping on the street and the small hut, disturbing the government. So the government identify all these people and put them in one locality, in one community. So government forward, come forward to build the houses for these kind of people so that they can be in one area. They were staying in a different area of the city, Chennai city. More than 14,000 families are living in that location. 14,000 families. Family. And so the average family would be how many? Six to 10. Six to 10. Father and mother, maybe children and uh, uh, old people, things like that. Some of them will be sleeping in the inside the room. Most of them will be sleeping on the roadside, outside, to get the nice air. It's actually more comfortable outside than inside. Yes, yes. You know, Prem, uh, when my wife and I were there the other day, um, it seemed to us as we went into that mm -hmm. slum, it was almost like a city within the city. That's right. Like it has its own feel to it. It's, it's like its own subculture. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Actually, <clears throat> in fact, one way the government has uh, really helped out the people, uh, when people were staying in the art houses uh, on the roadside, it was very difficult for them. So that's how they identified these people and they placed them in the uh, colony kind of this, these houses. But though they were provided houses, you know, these people are deprived from the employment daily routine. Right. And that's why, you know, they, 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 they were not used to the hygiene. They were not used to the, you know, regular routine. So there are lots of, you know, in all around the city, wherever thugs, you know, the people who were in rowdism and thugs, they were also put in one area. 
but we were able to see in the last 15 16 years we are able to see a total transformation in that area you know uh, not only through our uh, social uh, community services but also the government and the corporation which has come now you know there we started our garbage cleaning we initiated garbage cleaning and uh, thanks to the government now they have taken over and they are doing now it. this absolutely fascinates me because i uh, vincent you were telling my wife and i about this and i i was shaking my head as you're telling us oh. you start this garbage cleaning thing just on your own yes as calvary community ministries yes. cleaning up garbage the government sees what you're doing and says hey we want to do that yes and now the government's doing it yes yes i mean that's that's being a catalyst that's that's being a a real agent for change. I think the Bible would call that being salt and light. Sure. And and what about the violence against women factor? I, I know that there's news out of India all the time about violence against women. Uh, how are you addressing that issue? So we also, uh, for the past 20 plus years, we uh, Dad has been engaged in the women empowerment. Hmm. Not only giving them, giving them the job op opportunities, also the showing of the skill working, but we also give them, uh, you know, three months once value teaching. We say how we can, you know, really sustain in this very evil world. And uh, we are able to see the kind of improvement. But yet there is so much of prevalence of violence and women abuse. So, in fact, in the spiritual world, we are able to go to that area. As a church, we are able to do prayer walking. You know, we, we are able to cleanse that area. So over the last 21 years in the slum colony, we are able to see a lot of churches being planted, hundreds of churches planted in that, you know, small colony because yeah. every house, uh, at least one church is happening kind of thing. <laughs> so that's the kind of transformation we are, uh, you know. You know, there. this is truly amazing. Um, Jesus' ministry, as you look at it in the Gospels, yes. was to the last, the least and the lost. He, he really chose to minister to those who were in the most difficult circumstances. And this is what you're doing, and I, I'm so impressed. I've got about two minutes left. Uh, Vincent, sometimes those of us who are of a certain age think because our friends are doing it that we should be retiring from ministry. <laughs> are you feeling that you want to retire? I don't think. <laughs> Still, have a, I have an energy. I want to run. Yeah. The you race. want to run? Yeah. So I do. do I. I. I want to run. I run a bit more slowly, but I still want to run. And you you also, both of you, have quite an impact around the world, especially with Tamil speaking people with music. <laughs> yes. You you've you you've written all kinds of songs, praise yes. and worship songs, Vincent. Yes. And uh you you've recorded music. Uh Prem, I, I have a CD or two with you singing on them. Yes. Um did you ever think that one day you'd be reaching the Tamil world with your music ministry? Yes. I, does it surprise you this has happened? Yes. <laughs> I think when dad wrote that song, the first ever song when dad wrote it was, well, he was in his deathbed. That's how he wrote a song. So when he was in his deathbed... Excuse he, me, you're dying and you write a song? Yes. yes. Whoa. God so healed me. <laughs> and that started your music ministry? Yes, says, yes, yes. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when he wrote that song, you know, that, you know, he didn't know that would be a world number one hit song, you know. <laughs> uh, so you should, people who know the song in Paralogame and Sundame, yeah, so that, that, that's about the heaven, you know. Heaven is my home. So that's why he wrote it. And uh, after which, numbers of years, God gave him more, many more songs, hundreds of songs he has written, and uh, we are able to reach out. And our uh, social work, Mispa Charitable Trust, that that uh, over the last 25 years, we have been able to impact nearly more than thousands of people who have wow. been benefited through our ministry. That's fascinating. We could talk more and more about this. Heaven is my home, your first song, On Your Deathbed. Beautiful topic. Great ministry you both have. And it's inspiring and challenging. And I know our viewers are going to love it. And if we have Tamil-speaking viewers, which I know we do, of course. They probably already know the name Samuel. <laughs> thanks, thanks, men, for coming our way. And thank you, friends, for checking us out. So Rod Hembry is no stranger to most of you. He has been on television for a long time. Quick Study was the name of the show for many years, and now it's called Bible Discovery. And on the Internet, it's BibleDiscoveryTV.com. 
But Ron and I, together, Bible Discovery TV and WOW, working for Orphans and Widows, we have decided we're going to go out two by two. Yes. <laughs> in a very biblical manner. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, add a little salt and light in um, Chennai, India. And we've just seen the interview. Um, we, uh, last time you and I talked about this, we talked a little bit about the imprint that India had on you. Let's just follow the imprint thing a little further. You are a preacher's kid, but more than that, Ron Hembry, your dad, who died a few years ago, was a pioneering pastor. He was a pioneering television minister. He was an author of many books. But in his heart of hearts, he was a missionary. He was. In fact, he wanted to be a missionary, and uh, the circumstances set themselves up so he couldn't. So he was dedicated to helping other missionaries overseas. Yeah. One of the missionaries he helped was a tremendous influence on his life was Mark Bentain. Yeah. In Mark India. and Hulda Bentain in India. Yeah. And uh, so he, he was an amazing uh, driver of that. And uh, he just really felt strongly about it. Wrote the book, Mark the Man. Yeah. And uh, what an amazing book that is. And I don't know who published it, but uh, years ago, and, and it was just a story of what God did with a CBC radio man, how in Montreal, God really got a hold of Mark Pentain and captured his heart. And he said, he had a beautiful voice. And he said, at that time, I said, okay. And he went to India. The first thing that happened was he started preaching and started feeding people and his voice, because he preached all the time, his voice just deteriorated and became uh, kind of, uh, just felt kind of raspy. Well, it was raspy. I remember him, you know, I, I asked him one time, do you have a cold? He said, no, that's just the way it is. He said, too, <laughs> too, too, much, too much shouting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, it's interesting, uh, Rod, you, uh, you not only were imprinted with India when you were 17 years of age, and you told us last interview about uh, how that all happened, but um, India has uh, continued to be a part of your, kind of your DNA. I, I love the fact that we're partnering together yeah. on this. I, I just love the fact that we're supporting these guys that we've just seen. Yeah. They're the real heroes. Yeah, and, and you know, in an interview like that, and it was shot in their church, and it wasn't the best camera work, and you know, I, you, do what you, you, you do what you can, right? Sure. Um, uh, but they're doing a number of things, but what, they are doing that we together are going to be helping them with is caring for orphans and widows. Now, in the interview, I, we talked a little bit about this slum, largest slum in Southeast Asia. I haven't seen anything like it, Rod. When they told me about it, I thought, well, I've been to slums. You know, I, I've been to the slums of South Africa. I've been to the slums of Kenya. Uh, you know, it's usually just sprawling, you know, bits of uh, tin and mud and, and open sewers and, you know, just a, a total mess. What the Indian government did there is they built these sort of cement block houses for them. And the slum comprises about one and a half million people, but it looks like its own city. In fact, that's a bigger city than most of the cities in the United States. Well, well yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and so there, there they are, you know, with their ministry, uh, doing their best to be salt and light. And they need help. I mean, they're, they're always up against it. And through an interesting sequence of events, the Lord has led them our way. And I felt right away that this was an area where uh, Rod Hembry and Janice Hembry and Jim and Kathy and their ministries could join hands and Minister. do, some, do yeah. something worthwhile for orphans and widows. Interestingly, the widows that we're helping, specifically there right now, are elderly widows mm. who have been pushed out of their houses mm. and their extended families because of their faith in Jesus. Mm. That's important, Jim. We have to remember that God's children are people he loves, doesn't matter their age, but people he loves, and we gotta help them. Absolutely, and, and, and so uh, you do missions, we do missions. Um, together, we're trying to do our best to help make the world a better place for the sake of Christ. And uh, I would say, I'd say to you, our viewers, um, support Bible Discovery. I, mean, I know, know a lot of you do. They've been around a lot longer than we have. But support Bible Discovery, you know? Understand that it's more than just a Bible teaching program. They are vitally involved in changing the world through missionary outreach. And we're honored with working for Orphans and Widows, wow, to be engaged with Bible Discovery. Well, I think, I think they're terrific. I fully trust them. Uh, Rod is uh, like my little brother. <laughs> That's right. We've known each other a long time. A long, long time. I don't know which of us decided to grow the mustache and goatee first, but 
it comforts me to see that my little brother also has white in his beard like me. <laughs> Although he has more hair than I do. But anyway, friends, let's, let's, let's do it together. You know? So when you see Bible Discovery, when you see WOW, understand that we're working together in India and other places, which we'll tell you about in the future. But right now, it, the focus is Chennai, India. Jim Kennel on Today is a program dedicated to the teaching of the good news of Jesus Christ. This all through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. JCT also brings to you encouraging testimonies and stories from Christian leaders all over the globe. If this program has added value to your life, would you please consider becoming a partner? To do so, simply contact us by phone, mail, or online. Last time we were right in the middle of uh, Matthew's account of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with his sleepy disciples. And um, there's just one, one thing he says here. Let me go back to it. You know, it's the middle of the night and, and the disciples are sleepy. I, I mean, you know, wouldn't you be sleepy? I would be. And, you know, he, Jesus, is, uh, Luke says it was, he was about a stone's throw. You know, you throw a stone, what? One, 200 feet? So he was a fair distance from the disciples, praying by himself, and they fell asleep. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, it's maybe two or three in the morning at this point in time. Um, so he kind of scolds them, but at the same time he understands, especially when he says this, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Boy, isn't that true, huh? Uh, the flesh is kind of our defense mechanism against some of the urgencies and responsibilities the spirit brings our way. And the flesh <laughs> always wants to raise its, its head and say, excuse me, don't forget about me. What are you doing putting me under this stress just because you've got some notion of doing good? Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's part, of the, part of the human condition and uh, we just simply have to expect, expect that that's going to be the case. So anyway, he finally leaves them sleeping, and then he comes back again there, uh, and he wakes them up and says, look, my betrayer is at hand. So let's, let's pick it up uh, in verse 48 of Matthew 26. Now, his betrayer had given them, referring to this band of ruffians who'd come to arrest Jesus, had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus. They took him, and suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father? and he'll provide me with more than 12 legions of angels. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you didn't seize me. But all this is done that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Whoa. I certainly ask the question, and you probably do too, what's up with Judas saying, um, whomever I kiss, that's the one, take him. I mean, if there's anybody who was high profile, who had name recognition and face recognition in Jerusalem, it was Jesus. Now, maybe it's because it's nighttime, you know, and all they have is torchlight. I don't know. Maybe Judas thought that there's going to be a lot of confusion. You got a lot of people milling around. And so, you know, just watch the one I get to and I'll kiss him. And he's the one you take him. But to, uh, to choose this as the means of identifying Jesus is, uh, I think, a bad, bad taste. I, I, just, I just don't like it. So this great crowd of ruffians is there with uh, 
with Judas. These would be, not every, not everyone was a, a ruffian. Some would be soldiers and some would be temple guards who had a certain modicum of military discipline. But a lot of them would just be hangers on, insomniacs, people who just, you know, saw uh, a good show and they wanted to be a part of it. A big crowd. Judas finds Jesus and goes up to him and says, Hail, Master. Gee, can you believe this? And kisses him. You know, I, I remember reading somewhere, and it wasn't in some theological tome. I, I don't know. Anyway, I read this, is this one very astute observation by uh, the author of this book I was reading on human psychology. Every betrayal is a betrayal of oneself. Every betrayal is a betrayal of oneself. And this writer was thinking in terms of betrayal in marriage. And you betray your wife as a husband, and even as you're betraying her, you're betraying yourself. Because sooner or later, as the scripture says, your sin will find you out, and there's going to be uh, hell to pay. Not just in terms of your relationship with your wife, but also your relationship with your children, your neighbors, your extended family, perhaps even your employer. Uh, if you're a member of a church, your church uh, fellowship. I mean, every betrayal is a betrayal of, of yourself. I think there's a lot of truth there. And uh, one of the disciples, and Matthew doesn't name him, one of the other, uh, th there's others who, other places where he's named, but uh, he's a Galilean, obviously. He's untrained in the use of a sword, but he is armed. He takes a wild swing at the head of the high priest slave. Unfortunately, this guy saw the sword coming and he ducked and it just caught him in the ear, sliced his ear off. Uh, Jesus was not happy with this and rebuked this disciple for this uh, stupid act. Um, and uh, he says, put your sword back in its place. Okay, enough of this. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. That's uh, verse 52. Let me get to that. Yeah, uh, this way. Here we go. All who take the sword will perish by the sword. And he says, do you, you know, I think I can now pray to my father and he'll provide me more than 12 legions of angels instead of just one rough-hewn Galilean with a dull, rusty sword? Bit of a put down and rightly so. But he says, look, this has got to happen. Otherwise, the scriptures won't be fulfilled. To think that his disciples have any theological concern or any concern about the fulfillment of scripture, you'd say, what? But that's what Jesus said. And then he, he turns to the multitude of ruffians and says, what's going on here? You, you, uh, you've come to get me with swords and, 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 and clubs. You know, when I was there with you every day without guards, without some guy with a sword, you could have come and taken me then. I, I was totally vulnerable to, you know, being arrested. And you didn't do it then, so why are you doing it now? And you, you get the impression here that you know, Jesus is, is no victim. Yeah, he's, you know, not only could he have called legions of angels, uh, you know, to protect him, but he obviously was submitting to this. And he was submitting to it in the context of the fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. Uh, despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. By his stripes we are healed. You know, Isaiah 53 but so many other passages here and there throughout the Old Testament where there was reference to this suffering servant of God, this suffering Messiah who would be rejected, despised, and uh, destroyed by the people, just as so many of the prophets had been destroyed because the people didn't like their message. You know, I, I remember reading the story of a, of a miner whose lungs had been ruined by coal dust. Nevertheless, he attempted a a rescue of a trap miner in a fume-filled mine on one occasion. And, you know, he, he came out huffing and puffing, hardly able to breathe because of the damage his own lungs had incurred. And this one embittered fellow miner said to him, so they took your health too, huh? And he says, no, uh, I gave it. That's what Jesus was doing here. He was giving his life. He, he wasn't being taken... Uh, apart from his will to be taken. He, he, he saw the big picture. 
he knew that there was something going on here, a drama, if you will, a reality in the heavenlies that none of them, even the disciples, could even hope to grasp at that point in time. Jesus was, you know, on the threshold of uh, dying for the sins of mankind, of taking all humanity's sin upon himself. Can you imagine the load that was? And bearing the punishment, the wages of sin is death, dying so that you and I would not have to die. And we're ta not talking here about our physical death, we're talking about our spiritual death. So that one day we could stand before the Lord, covered, if you will, in the atoning work of Christ on Calvary, and be accepted as righteous by the Heavenly Father, rather than seen as sinners uh, with perdition in store. It's a, it's, a, it's a moving story that's unfolding here. And that's what Jesus understands, that's why he's committed to it. He knows it's going to hurt. He knows it's going to be difficult. But thank God he submitted to it. JCT TV is the official voice of WOW, working for orphans and widows. Jim Cantillon is the founder of WOW and has been ministering to orphans and widows in distress for 18 years. WOW's focus is home-based care for the dying. The horizon is vast, with thousands of the least of these in Africa and India. WOW depends on your generous support. To connect with us, you can call us at 1-800-969-9551 or you can visit us online at wowmission.com. You know, friends, uh, this program comes to you uh, free of charge. Uh, we don't have sponsors. Uh, we, together with Working for Orphans and Widows, represent not only a ministry of teaching the Gospels, but also of reaching out to orphans and widows in their distress uh, in uh, various parts of Africa and now in India. And we need your support, simple as that. Uh, by supporting WOW and JCT, you're supporting uh, not only this teaching ministry, but also our ministry to orphans and widows in Africa. And from time to time, I'll giving you little updates about it. Uh, but we need your support. When you send in your support, ask for Catalan's Casual Commentary. I produced it in four volumes that will fit into an envelope or you can tuck it into your Bible. Uh, they're very convenient, put in a pocket. And this is all of Matthew, filling in the blanks that I cannot fill in in the short time I have on air. And I'll be very, very pleased to send it to you. Remember to support us. We really need your help. And we love it that you're watching. Oh, oh, oh.